All right, welcome back to this uh, music track on the theme reality track on stage eight. My name is Andrea Götzke and um, together with my colleague Eric Eitel, we have put together this um, track today and invited uh, all those people who I think had very interesting things to say throughout the day so far. And uh, for this conversation, um, there's just kind of one sentence in the session descriptions, which is kind of, we reflect on the reality check theme of the day <laughs> with Matt Dryhurst. And is, uh, Matt is sitting next to me now. Ma Matt, you're an artist and educator. Yep. Uh, you work solo and together with Holly Herndon. Yep. Your, uh, the album, new album is coming out in this a few week. days this week. Yep. And uh, you're a lecturer at NYU and um, yeah, uh, thinker and commentator on I have uh, a Twitter account. Yeah. <laughs> on um, yeah, various topics in <coughs> music, culture, business, society. Lots of different things. So we felt that you would be a good person to do this kind of reality check Sounds talk good. with us. <coughs> um, maybe to uh, get back a bit what we had in mind with the theme reality check. Let me make this even a bit louder here. Um, so I mean The internet promised a democratization of music, accessibility, lots of increase in creativity and so on. And in fact, this also happened. There's so much music there and so many interesting stuff happening. Um, and what we wanted to discuss throughout the day and have already over various sessions is to look from a perspective of diversity mm -hmm. uh, in music, diversity also in like, perspectives and different technological platforms and artistic <coughs> views and so on. Um, what are the chances of the... Um, like people on the margins also to participate in the overall discourse uh, so kind of um, look into this promised democratization of culture mm -hmm. and where we are with this at this point and um, yeah maybe we start with a bit of an analysis of of this very cool very quick i mean it's a very broad topic it's pretty broad <laughs> and we have just 30 minutes but um maybe to kind of already like put the fields or set the ground uh, with I, i'm gonna um quote some things you've said earlier so you don't have to do this again and Sounds then good. <laughs> you can we can take off from here i attended your talk at ctm festival earlier this year that is also published uh, online i think mm -hmm. it was just three months ago about three months ago and in that talk um you debated uh, or you discussed about how independent music scenes often see brand funding as a sellout um, however, you were arguing that organizations like Red Bull Music Academy or Boiler Room are kind of or the only or were kind of the only ones um, to actually invest or channel money to those kind of scenes next to public funding. Also, that is also important in some countries uh, like to invest in challenging music and music on the margins and so on and um, nurture or as you also said artificially inflate scenes that would otherwise be more precarious <coughs> in, an, in an environment of platform capitalism and political turns to the right also in many places and um, since then Red Bull Music Academy that ironically also has through the Red Bull CEO also some connections to those right-wing developments has already announced their closing mm -hmm. I mean, just <coughs> over this short time. And um, yeah, with this, I kind of wanted to like set the ground and then navigate into the discussion, maybe from the, art uh, the narrative of independence, mm -hmm. which you have tweeted <laughs> about uh, in the recent weeks a little bit. And yeah, I found this interesting to like come from that angle. Yeah, I think in terms of reality check, for me, um, I... <laughs> I have no choice but to be constantly checking reality because this is how I make a living, right? And have been involved in these spaces on the margins for a couple, almost a couple of decades now. Um, and so, yeah, I think 
when looking at a topic of independence, my line on it has been that, look, it, it, there was a period of time from, what, the, the 60s, you could, Fred Turner would argue, you could go all the way back to the 1920s, um, but from, like, the 60s to the 1990s, where this kind of uh, uh, shared kind of ideological focus on making your own decisions, um, not being held down by the man, um, is somewhat forgivable because you were talking about a kind of like monolithic, quite conservative cultural center um, and, you know, new ideas, particularly under like a very heavily centralized kind of major label music industry, um, were kind of monopolizing or, or not doing a great job of representing um, uh, many things that were happening on the margins. And so this concept of independence um, quite understandably gathered this idea of saying, well, no, you could do it yourself, which happened, you know, in parallel with certain technological developments and um, the ability to travel and send things cheaply and all, all kind of this stuff. Um, my argument is, is less to try and excavate that and more to try and say, well, you know, how useful is that um, as an ideological position in a contemporary sense? Um, and I don't think it's all that useful at all. Um, uh, part of the reason, I'm not the only person who's talked about this, Liz Pelly, who um, is wonderful, has also talked about this, but part of the reason why I choose to kind of undress independence is uh, I'm sure there's a great many people at this conference and at other less kind of left-leaning tech conferences for, for whom that is the ultimate objective. The ultimate objective being to give everybody the tools to basically become, you know, independent mercenaries that are free of all institutional support, um, are free of a paycheck, are free of healthcare, right? Um, so the line I used in the CTM talk was, you know, we're now all independent to deliver other people's food um, and, uh, you know, rent out uh, uh, someone's apartment. Um, and of course, we find that, like, independence in and of itself doesn't uh, make us all that happy, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, taking that perspective and then looking backwards, at the great kind of independent label ecosystem that people love to fetishize, and there's many a great many th things about that that are really rewarding. Um, the conclusions I've started to come to is that actually the independence part was only really one kind of part of it. That the understandably, you know, having like a hardcore label being able to distribute its music to a bunch of people who wouldn't wouldn't have heard it otherwise. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but somehow fetishizing this kind of like independent individualism of it is the dominant narrative of the economy, right? Mm -hmm. We have, uh, you know, uh, Airbnb is the biggest you know, uh, uh, hotel company that owns no hotels. Uber is the biggest um, taxi company that owns no taxis, right? Like uh, outsourcing everything and, and, and kind of uh, removing these institutions um, uh, is, is kind of the status quo. And so it feels a bit peculiar that under a kind of independence mindset, um, people still, and Spotify being like one example that I love to, to, to rail on because I think they're heinous, um, but kind of milk this idea of independence dry. And so in, you know, in, in my other reading of it, um, the, the thing that I find the most valuable about those communities on the margins that would be described as independent was, was the interdependence of them, mm -hmm. was the fact that they did actually represent networks of interdependent uh, economic arrangements, right? Mm -hmm. Like a label helped an artist do X, Y, Z. The 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 person who did the artwork got paid. Um, the distributor, all these people who, if you are a professional musician and you know, like you understand the difference between you having a career and you not having a career in pretty much every circumstance, is access to those networks mm -hmm. and not messing that up, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, yeah, so I think that the, 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 the kind of interdependence narrative is one that, uh, that we might do well to kind of uh, to think about. Because when, as soon as you start thinking about that, you start thinking, well, you know, what kind of uh, uh, networks or organizations could you create under those premises? You were just speaking to two co-ops earlier, and I, I'm generally supportive of cooperatives as a, as a, uh, as a thing. Um, but yeah, but I, I, I'm, in my mind, I, on the reality check theme, I think we've reached kind of peak independence. Um, mm -hmm. And I wrote an article for The Guardian recently where I said, you know, the, the thing, of it, this kind of the goodwill engendered by that word has basically provided an alibi for the devastation of institutions that, in my mind, um, protect the archive. So protect our understanding of history or musical history, which is being rewritten um, by the streaming platforms. Um, and, uh, uh, and on top of that, the institutions that 
that enable for musicians and for things that are not kind of uh, um, uh, b best complementary to the kind of algorithmic populism approach of a, of a, of a YouTube or, or a Spotify, um, allow those things to grow long enough for people to actually be able to make a career. Because the real danger that we're in at the moment is that, you know, in the minds of the streaming platforms, there's always going to be a supply of new music by new young people uh, fired up by the spirit of independence um, and you know, believing that their special gesture uh, will, will change the world. Um, they only need them to believe that for as enough time as there is for the next person to come along. And so we see this kind of insane churn in music of, oh, there's this new thing, and then it dissipates and goes away. And the only thing that remains constant is, is somehow uh, the, the streaming platform itself, right? So independence also, again, fuels the kind of the expendability of, of, of artists or of new movements. Um, and I think that the, uh, uh, probably everyone in attendance or who bothers to watch this on, on YouTube um, cares about that, um, cares that the archive is preserved and that we feel like certain aesthetic gestures are actually leading towards something and aren't just disposable and, and expendable. And I think also the like um, wh what we see, wh what you described like with Spotify, or um, when we when we uh, see at like I mentioned in the intro, if, like Red Bull like provide a lot of money, but they're closing now. When we think about uh, MySpace recently deleting like 53 million files or something, then we see it's also we are not independent. Yeah, yeah, like we are, yeah. we are, we are actually dependent on quite a few actors, and then we better like from from what you've written. I also think okay, we better like are dependent on those people that maybe share the same values. Absolutely, as we do. And, yeah. and you see it the same with with magazines are closing. Um, you know, a lot of these, uh, uh, and there's this question of you know what happens to the the artist or the musician who whose history or legacy is preserved by those publications. Um, mm -hmm beyond even the music being lost, right? I'm not 100% confident that SoundCloud will be around in whatever uh, iteration it's going to be around in in 10 years' time. I'm, I'm certainly not confident about that. So what happens to all of that history? And it's not just the music, it's the interactions, it's the context of it, right? Um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a problem. And, and, and naturally, in a sense, so the way I tried to reorder it, at least in the talk, was saying everyone's focused on brand money. Yeah, like there are all kinds of problems with accepting brand money. Some people to each their own, right? Um, but I don't see equivalent zeal concerned with the kind of savaging of this kind of archive mentality. And, and what I would give Red Bull Music Academy and Boiler Room and other people who, who cause controversy on that, what I'll give them credit for is that they have at least attempted to honor that legacy. Um, and you can find easily as many people who, who will, who will, who will um, argue in their favor um, as who won't. Um, and so th there's a real concern for me that, you know, under this kind of, uh, under the spirit of, an, of antagonism, of kind of mindless antagonism, um, we, we are missing the bigger picture here, which is that we have, I don't know how much longer we have before pretty much all, um, mo or most people's access to culture is being filtered through uh, an, al an opaque, algorithmically populist, a uh, platform like Spotify that does not just ignore um, the legacy of, of independent, whatever you want to call it, music on the margins, it actively suppresses it. Mm -hmm. It's actively antagonistic towards it, right? And so I've written about this before. You go to Spotify and try and find the name of the record label, try and find any um, recognition of the provenance of the work. No, it doesn't matter. These are all, and, and that's a design decision. That's not a, 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 an accidental omission. Mm -hmm. That's a design decision to all of a sudden um, place us within a in a in a um, an environment of no place of no context mm -hmm. that of course allows for them to to, to, to direct culture in whatever way they please um, and so yeah so so th while the brand thing is a it, it is an entertaining conversation I could talk about it forever that to me is the much bigger problem mm -hmm. and of course that's also the more difficult problem to talk about because many uh, journalistic entities or labels or whatever it might be kind of bought into it, right? So 
I'll see, you know, in major publications, arguments about Red Bull Music Academy and so on and so forth, and then at the, their end of year list for the records, every single one of them is available on Spotify. Almost to the point, you would almost ask the question, uh, if you were on Spotify, would you qualify for review by a publication? And these are left-leaning publications. These, are, these aren't kind of commercial publications. These are, you know, publications on the margins, kind of all bought into this idea that, um, that to me is just is, is fundamentally flawed, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, so I, I think this, this also goes even, I just recently, a um, few days ago, I saw an announcement for a new book coming out about the live and festival market mm. that is describing, I mean, I haven't read the book because it's just, I, just the announcement how big players are merging and now also like take in private equity and offer like data as a business model in festivals like kind of as a similar as the, as a platform model mm. and um, yeah so so also there in in the kind of mainstream or bigger world it's not um, the kind of yeah music culture or music scenes that are long um, often interest of the people who maybe have the money and get the money and bring it back, but it's more like the, the audience and the content or wh whatever, what also um, Peter was describing before in, in his talk, that it's uh, about content and um, audience for the bigger platforms like Spotify. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's yeah. Music has become like a lifestyle marketing product, right? Um, and that is the, you know, an opportunity for some and, and kind of a defeat for others, right? Is that um, I was trying to explain this also in my talk, but the, um, you know, there's a fundamental kind of misunderstanding in many cases of how platform capitalism works, right? Um, and the, the analogy I always use is one of, of, of kind of a, a cartographic analogy, right? So you're like, Google maps the web. They mapped the web. They didn't ask permission for it. They just mapped it. And as a result of having access to that map that changes from second to second, um, they can create trade routes on that web, right? Facebook does the same with relationships, right? So they, if they own that map under the advertising model, th that map's incredibly valuable because they know how to get your cargo from A to B on that map, mm -hmm. right? Um, so again, I think part of the reason why, you know, independent or traditionally marginalized music, people are like, misunderstand. Well, how can it be that this, you know, queer noise artist all of a sudden can be playing on this major festival and you're like, well, they're expanding the map, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the if, if the dominant model, like model of, of the internet that was decreed that it would be an advertising model, then they already have enough people to find, you know, the, the, the center in the suburbs, right? If you are an artist, if you as an artist can combine a unique set of metadata that can help find an entirely untapped audience, then you're valuable under platform capitalism, right? You alone normally, right? Because um, again, we get into this kind of the mercenary habits of, of this stuff. Um, but yeah, of course. And so, you know, uh, festivals or any, um, like the live music industry is, is also an opportunity to tap into that. And mm -hmm. there's, you know, there, there's positives from that. Being a working artist, I enjoy the fact that our live fees are, keep us going, to be honest. Um, the negative of it is that you start to see um, kind of a, a machinic kind of a consolidation on certain things where occasionally, you know, I, I won't name names, but you'll go to a, a festival, it's like a four-day festival of 120 BPM techno, and everybody there looks the same, and you know, you know, it's it, 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 it's in a sense kind of sucks out the the provenance of things and becomes about kind of a celebration of of of, of similarity or something like this, um, and yeah, so these these mm. things are these things are are, are are of course very enticing, um, uh, yeah. Um, so let's uh, move on from the analysis to the protocols. Yep. I think that you talk uh, about a lot and actually like this term, because b with protocol you mean like, what do we actually want? Like, how do we want to define yep. our world? Like, where do we want to go? Sure. And um, wh what, what's, wh what would you, wh wh what's your idea? Like, what, wh what do you suggest wh what we can do? Well, it's to yeah. kind of change the environment for ourselves. I have a few. I have a few clues. I mean, so yeah, th just to clarify the protocols thing quickly. Um, the reason I bring that up is that just generally, again, kind of like the independence critique, I meet a lot of people who seem they're like they're really well intentioned, but I don't know whether they know what they believe, right? 
Um, and so the protocols thing was an attempt by me to say, I'm going to take certain archetypes in culture and be like, and try and reduce down what their actual belief system is. And the most, yeah, maybe more controversial one of these is looking at DJs, right? And so I look at DJs and I say, well, you know, what, what is the fundamental protocol of this practice, right? Forget the history, which is very storied and wonderful, and I know plenty of DJs or whatever, but like, what is the fundamental principle here? And the principle is that I can, because of, like, through my own special taste, take the work of anybody else and make profit through performing it for others. That's the fundamental protocol, right? And then as a society, because the PROs don't work and all this kind of stuff, we've kind of allowed that to slide, right? And so I would raise that question and say, well, that in a sense, that protocol is very complementary to the protocol of Web 2, right? Because Web 2 was all about curators with special taste reaping the rewards of stuff that they find online, right? So p the most popular Instagram accounts are people just finding cool stuff they found online, sticking it on their Instagram account, and then selling ads off the back of it. Or in a DJ's case, making live fees off the back of this, right? So, so there's plenty of DJs who don't intend that to be the way it works. Um, but when you start thinking about it on a very basic level there, you can start having ideas. And so one of the ideas I had is like, well, why don't DJs who are making above a certain amount of money, so let's say they're making two figures a minute, not one figure a minute, but two figures a minute, so 6,000 euros an hour. And there's many, many DJs who make above that. Um, why don't they do a profit split with the artists who they are playing? Mm -hmm. And then people say, well, how would you ever track that? How would you ever? I'm like, no, I wouldn't have to track it. They could do it because they're not making the music, so it should be a pleasure for them to participate in such a network. So right? it's it's like a feeling of solidarity Absolutely, with your yeah. with the people Absolutely. you are kind of making music with because this is kind of what they're doing. Yeah. Well, well, for example, so that's an idea that comes up, and I've had a lot of conversations with PROs and and other people, you know, what name names, but but other people there, and they're like. Yeah, that's a cool idea. I'm like, well, why did no one have that idea before? And they're like, well, all the institutions of electronic music are all run by DJs. I'm like, ah, okay, that's that's why no one had that idea before. Um, but for example, that's I mean, that's one suggestion. Um, but even in throwing out that suggestion to people, you very quickly get to understand their protocol, mm -hmm. right? Because I've had good arguments with people who come back to me and say, well, no, 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 I don't agree with that. And I'm like, well, good. Now I know what you believe, right? But what we don't, what what it does in the sense is it forces the issue, so that now we can have a proper conversation about actual alternatives, mm -hmm. rather than kind of luxuriating in this kind of shared faux solidarity history mm. around electronic music and rave culture and all this stuff that, as I say, Spotify and you know, Vodafone likes to likes to kind of weaponize, right? Mm. Like, no, we're having an actual conversation about the the, the transaction of of goods and value. Um, it, I think it's it, like to me. It sounds like it's also much um, like seeing yourself as part of a scene and as part of like a creative group that wouldn't like any one person wouldn't exist without the other somehow. And, and in the case of DJs, that's particularly egregious, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you know, it's th there's also other dynamics that come into this, right? Like mm -hmm. how many people make the music played by anonymous black people. Mm. Um, so kind of the protocol of inter interdependence that you mentioned ab before. Absolutely. And, kind of and so and so as a moral argument, I think it's quite interesting. And as again, I can I can hear arguments against it, but mm. but I've started thinking uh, more from those perspectives by thinking from first principles and saying, okay, well, you know, what little changes could we do on that kind of protocol layer um, and what new results might come from that? Mm -hmm. And I think, for example, that... Uh, taxing or having a solidarity arrangement with people who make over 6,000 euros an hour playing other people's music might create a pool of money that we could do interesting things with, mm -hmm. right? You have in your in your article in The Guardian that you mentioned, you were also talking about something like a scene wealth fund or something like this could be organized. Can you maybe explain this a little bit? We only have five minutes left. So Great. Anything. Okay. No, a scene wealth fund, I mean, there's, there's a few ideas that, there's a few uh, places that have experimented with this. Um, that it's, uh, it's a lot to go into in a couple of minutes. But basically the idea is you pull a bunch of money together and you collectively do stuff with it. So cooperatively owned spaces are one really, really interesting uh, mm -hmm. dynamic there that I'm particularly very interested in. Um, similarly, in, in seeing the death of something like an RBMA that behind the scenes also funded a lot of visas 
for people, like artists coming from uh, the Caribbean or you know uh, southern uh, the southern African Peninsula, who previously it would be, it's actually quite expensive to get them to come to Europe. Um, one of the things I proposed was saying, well, you know. Now that this is gone, someone's got to pick up that slack. And so if you value this being an international conversation, it might be a good idea to pull together funds mm -hmm. um, to be able to fund visas. You know, because it's, I mean, it's, it's reprehensible how difficult it is for Jamaican artists, for example, who considering how influential they've been on global music, how difficult it is for them to travel. Someone's got to pick up that bill. Mm -hmm. um, and so different, as I say, protocols or different economic arrangements, anyone in this room could think of a hundred things to do. The one thing I would say, though, is I don't believe people are going to pay for music anymore. I think that that's like one potential thing you could spend a lot of time on that might not work. Why not think of a thousand other things that get down to the that get down to, to, to what we value? And and what I value is that you can, you know, that uh, that uh, music on the margins is a community of people, uh, an international conversation. Um, it's a conversation that has spaces that represent something, right? Um, that have a protocol to them that are different from the other spaces or festivals that represent something that are different to the others. And so it's quite feasible to me um, if you shift this conversation from you know, kind of opining about the, the death of micropayments between one individual to another person and you change that conversation to an interpen interdependent one where mm -hmm. you're saying, no, actually, you have ownership in this scene um, and potentially a stake in the venue, mm -hmm. or potentially you're helping to fund these artists to travel, or what, whatever it might be. That to me is a much more interesting economic proposition um, than you know asking people to buy a track that they can stream thanks to Spotify um, for for basically nothing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So kind of organizing infrastructures t together as a community or as a group interested in a particular scene of music. Exactly. Like including the fans, like the labels, the, the agents, yeah. the, the artists. Like and what's everybody. funny about that, of course, is that that is the, the common romantic narrative sold about the original indies, right? The original indie, the common narrative is, oh, they all banded together and made this new infrastructure together. I'm like, yeah, that was the cool part. It wasn't the independence part. That, that has been overemphasized. The cool part was the interdependence part of like, oh, this part needs help, right? Um, it's 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 shared funds to create new infrastructure, and I think that that honestly, in the greater scheme of things, if I could if I could summarize and, and talk about the urgency of this, when I go online and I see so there's such a, a, a marketplace now for people larping or pretending to be somehow radical, you know, uh, contributing to conversations, making music that that basically formally doesn't do anything different to, to what anything you would have heard mm -hmm. for the past 20 years, I would say that this kind of infrastructural stuff is actually a radical litmus test. Mm -hmm. That's why I bring up protocols. I'm like, well, how much solidarity, you know, do you really support mm -hmm. if I said when you start earning past 6K, you have to pay the people who made the music you're playing? Mm -hmm. For example, right? So, so I think at some point someone has to draw a line in the sand and 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 get to the the, the bottom of what we actually believe, because otherwise we're just uh, uh, you know we're just kind of left wide open to be uh, 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 yeah. Otherwise, we don't really have much of an argument against the platform capitalists, basically. And probably we're also stronger, no, or more resilient. Like Hopefully. if we're a group of people, than just being alone. You know, I hope so. Of, yeah. I hope so. And 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 and, and as I say, I, I think you know. It, it's not to, not to uh, add like animosity to it, but it's like I like calling people's bluff on this mm -hmm. stuff because then we'll see how strong we actually are. Okay, I think we already have to end, unfortunately. That's no problem. This went very fast. That's good. <laughs> um, thank you, Matt. Thank you. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah.